again. I just don't give him my camera. I'm picking it up. Sorry about that. Hi my lovelies, and welcome back to my channel. So this week's video is gonna be something I'm really excited about. One thing that's a pretty common occurrence with cartoons is that they can be extremely short-lived, especially now in, well, it's 2024, but I was gonna say 2023, uh, because we are in this time where shows not just limited to animation are being canceled left and right, even when like they didn't necessarily perform badly. And then more commonly than not, they're being completely removed from the streaming services where they, you know, are being destroyed distributed and even originated from, which is very worrisome considering how easily this makes for shows to become lost media. And there's whole teams of people who worked on these projects, so it's really devastating. My point is, I have a lot of shows that I remember fondly from my childhood that ended up being very short-lived and disappearing one day, which often left me very confused. From Harvey Beaks to Garage Band to I Didn't Do It, the list definitely goes on. But the crown of shows that were short-lived unfortunately goes to a somewhat hidden gem, at least nowadays because of its short run called Making Fiends. And that's what we're gonna dive into in today's video, um, how Making Fiends began its transition to television and the tragic fate of the series today, as well as diving into every single episode. But before we get right into the episodes, of course, we're gonna do a little bit of background. Making Fiends was a flash animated cartoon series created by Amy Winfrey, but it wasn't Amy's only creation when it comes to animation. That rhymed. <laughs> Amy actually got her start with animation while attending UCLA in the 90s, I believe, and she is kind of one of those like it happened with fate. She basically picked animation out of a catalog for classes but ended up absolutely falling in love with it and decided to enter the UCLA animation um, MFA program full-time after this. And actually Amy's first job in the industry would be as an animator for South Park during her time at UCLA. Which is so funny because I see the parallels between that and Making Fiends. Like when I started watching it I was like did she work on South Park? Because I'm like I'm getting that kind of vibe, if that makes sense. I know specifically right off the bat uh, with the teacher, Mr. Milk, he almost immediately reminded me a bit of Mr. Garrison, but if he was um, maybe depressed in a different dimension. But yeah, that's a really cool place to get your start, especially because South Park would go on to be such a huge thing, and this was just, you know, during season one. It's also important to note she worked on the show with fellow UCLA students Peter Merriman, Martin Sengenda, and Aglaya Marchiva, all names who would go on to be very important when it comes to making fiends. See, at the time, um, South Park was happening in the very same neighborhood as the UCLA campus, and the creators had put up flyers on campus, like on their bulletin board looking for animators. Before Making Fiends, Amy would also go on to work on several cartoons of her own, like Muffin Films, Hooray for Hell, and Big Bunny. And not to jump ahead, but Amy would also later go on to direct for both BoJack Horseman, which is easily one of the best adult animated series of all time, and Tuca and Birdie, which I haven't seen personally, but I've heard nothing but good things about. I don't really dive into those projects as much as I dive into Making Fiends, but after I binge like the whole entirety of Making Fiends on YouTube, the algorithm recommended me this video, and although I didn't watch it since I don't usually watch videos about topics where I'm already like making a script for it because I want, you know, to be as original as possible, but by the thumbnail alone and Bojack being included, I can only assume this creator dives into those things deeper than I do. So if you are interested in kind of the beginning and more of Amy's work, I would definitely go check out that video essay if it interests you. Anyway, back to Making Fiends, the premise of the show is we follow like the interactions between these two two young girls named Vendetta, who's a villainous tomboy that regularly makes terrible creatures she calls fiends, hence the name of the show being Making Fiends, and Charlotte, who is a complete opposite to her, a cheerful, young, gullible, girly girl who is convinced that Vendetta is her best friend. And the thing with Charlotte's character, too, is she unintentionally irritates and annoys Vendetta to extreme levels. Like, Vendetta, her life's mission has become to destroy Charlotte. So throughout the show, we follow Vendetta as she makes several fiends in order to destroy Charlotte, but she always ends up failing due to Charlotte's just like utter good luck. Charlotte has this way with the fiends where she's either always able to turn them into like no longer a monster wanting to kill her and suddenly they love Charlotte, or she's able to turn them against her and onto Vendetta and then they go after Vendetta instead. But yeah, pretty simple concept. I probably over explained because this concept can be explained perfectly just by watching the theme song for the show, which can I just say is quite a banger. Making fiends, making fiends, Vendetta's always making fiends, making fiends while Charlotte makes friends. 
Now, I touched on this in my Happy Tree Friends video, but in the early days of the internet and like flash animation, people were realizing, you know, anybody could make a cartoon. So a lot of people, what they would do was they would make websites to distribute their creations. I mentioned this because this is exactly the same route that this show took, with the website for Making Fiends first being put up on June 3rd of 2003, and then the series would debut on the following month with its first episode on July 14th of 2003. No way, Lula doesn't pronounce the T in debut? I can't, I'm sorry. Guys, I'm from California. This is something I just do. I don't know how to stop. It will probably happen again. Anyway, Making Fiends would run online through the website for the uh, first two years-ish of the show as the series took shape and drew more and more fans. And this show got enough attention that Amy actually began selling t-shirts and DVDs in her like online gift shop for Making Fiends, and the sales were good enough that Amy could actually make a living from this show. However, by 2004, the website would actually catch the attention of Nickelodeon, who wanted to possibly bring the show to their network and have it on TV. So negotiations had officially began, and within a year of this, the long developmental period for Making Fiends had started. And during that development for Making Fiends, Amy like still continued to create new webisodes um, independently, and her own gift shop remained open for business. So not much really changed at this point when it came to Making Fiends, and they were still in talks and everything. But eventually, in 2006, Nickelodeon began to distribute the many earlier webisodes on their streaming site called Turbo Nick, and then even later as video podcasts on iTunes. More importantly though, it was in late 2006 when Nickelodeon finally told Amy the good news, that they were going to officially be picking up Making Fiends for its first televised season. So with this, Amy got to move into her new office at Nickelodeon in around January of 2007, and after this, the production immediately began. The production for Making Fiends would take about over a year and it wasn't until the following year on October 4th of 2008 that Making Fiends would premiere its first episode on TV. Now, 2008 was a very big year for Making Fiends because it was, well, it's only year. That's right. Making Fiends ran for not even a month on Nicktoons. Originally, it was actually meant to air on Nickelodeon itself, but like last minute, the show was moved to their sister channel, Nicktoons, which is whatever. The strangest part of this is the show didn't even do bad. In fact, at one point, from what I could find, Making Fiends was even their highest rated program on Nicktoons. So despite the positive reviews and above average ratings though, the show ended up abruptly being canceled after only airing six episodes. On November 1st of 2008, which is just days away, from its one month anniversary on the network. Shows get canceled all the time, Lula, you said it yourself. Why does this stick out or matter so much? Well, remember how Nickelodeon wanted to bring, you know, her web series to TV? Well, that meant that they own it. Like, meaning that Making Fiends, when it was abruptly canned from the network, Amy is now no longer able to make any more content for Making Fiends ever again. A series that Amy worked on for six years just for Nickelodeon to cancel it after not even a month of airing on TV. Because technically, now, she doesn't own it. Nickelodeon does. Wonderful. I said it in my noggin video too, but every day, I'm just given more reasons to dislike Nickelodeon as a company. Every time I look into something related to them, they are just up to no good. And because of this, it makes sense that my personal experience with Making Fiends was a very vague fever dream. At first, I wasn't even sure how I found this show. I thought maybe I found it online because, you know, it's all on YouTube and Amy has it on her YouTube channel. But if it's true that they aired reruns until 2012 at least, then I believe I did find this show through Nicktoon because Nicktoons was home to a handful of shows I remember, like Sanjay and Craig, Breadwinners, and good old Harvey Beaks. How did those all last longer than making fiends? Anyway, um, going into this video, all I really remembered was the theme song, which for a long time I thought I kind of made up. You don't really see people talk about this show, but eventually I stumbled upon this show after getting back into animation and discovering kind of like the animation cartoon community. My initial thoughts after watching the first two episodes were, am I a fraud? Like, I had some doubts about my own memory because I thought, have you ever like mixed 
you thought you had nostalgia for one thing and you mix it up with something else. I thought that was maybe what was happening. I was a little scared. However, that all changed after seeing episode three titled Super Evil, where as soon as it started, like the, f the floodgates opened and it all just started coming back to me. I was like, this is the one where she connected all the dots and made a picture, isn't it? Like I remember that so vividly and I was right. That was the ending. So this truly was a show where I think I saw it once. Like I, I think this is the only episode I saw on Nicktoon and somehow I just never saw it again. I don't know how common reruns were for this, but you know, must have not been very common if that happened to me. But yeah, it's very bizarre to me, but it is never too late to, you know, revisit a cartoon you didn't get to finish. That's what I always say. Well, I don't, I just said that right now. <laughs> also not really that bizarre because it reminds me of my experience with Ruby Gloom. Basically, I found Ruby Gloom on Netflix like years after it like had been on TV and stuff. You know, it's Canadian, so I don't know where it was airing in the US, but I didn't watch it on TV like that. But yeah, I found Ruby Gloom on Netflix. I was like, whoa, why have I never seen this? Binged the entire thing in about a week, I think. And then eventually I forgot about it. It was removed from the service. And I kind of thought that maybe I made it up. And then years later, I had to kind of conduct a search and all I could remember was the theme song. That's how I was able to hunt it down online and then be like, whoa, this has like a huge fan base. <laughs> but I think that's enough of my rambling. Um, we should just get straight into the episodes, which by the way, as I said, I watched on YouTube um, in the span of like 12 hours, though there's only about less than two hours worth of content. I just took extensive notes, so it obviously took longer for me to finish it. Anyway, I wanted to mention its availability because I urge you to check it out after this video. It's a hidden gem, as I said earlier. It's such a treat. Even if you didn't grow up with it, I think you will still enjoy the charm of the show has. If you even wanted to watch it first and then come back to hear my thoughts, you could do that. But I'll be breaking down all the episodes anyway, so you don't necessarily need to go like rewatch it to watch this video. Also, one last note, um, here is the official order of the episodes from the Making Fiends website. The only thing I'm going to be doing differently is the order. I'll be referring to them as like their own episodes, but still only six episodes aired. The format of the show was just kind of like fish hooks, for example, that I've talked about where it was like two or three stories per episode, two or three short stories, may I add. So these are not, they didn't all individually air as episodes, but I'm just counting them each as their own episode, if that makes sense. I just think that's easier. Also, the order in which they aired and like which ones aired together was a little contradicting online, so I couldn't find a straightforward answer. And then the second thing I wanted to say was I'll be talking about the actual like shorts they aired at the end, so it's less confusing. But yeah, without further ado, let's get on into the episodes of Making Fiends. Episode one is titled Charlotte Charlotte's first day, and well, it's exactly that. We follow Charlotte as she attends her first day of school in Clamsburg. She just moved from Vermont, and she's hoping to make some friends. We gather very quickly that something is off here, and everyone is clearly scared of something that the viewer just can't see yet. Hell, even the teacher's afraid. They all have this look and feeling of uneasiness, especially when Charlotte comes in and she sits down in a specific chair that apparently belongs to someone else. That someone else ends up being our other main character, whose name is Vendetta. What a lovely name. Am I right? And as the theme song says, once there was a little girl, a girl who could make fiends, she kept the town terrified, the girl who could make fiends. This is now challenged that Charlotte moved to town because she wants to befriend Vendetta, resulting in their kind of newfound rivalry. Well, rivalry, but it's completely one-sided, but I have a theory on that we'll get into later. This episode, though, establishes that, with Charlotte's cluelessness kind of being like a safety net around her. Her classmates even seem terrified when she goes out to play during recess. Well, that's not recess, but Vendetta says it's recess, so apparently it's recess and she's in charge now? Isn't it time for recess? But I just started to... <coughs> oh. Oh. Why, yes, it, it is time for recess. Uh, class dismissed. It's recess already? This is such a great school! But the reason they're so terrified for Charlotte is because the playground is infested with fiends. Despite class not happening though, we do find out that show and tell is tomorrow, which Vendetta decides to take as just the perfect opportunity to take down Charlotte, while Charlotte, on the other hand, brings, you know, her hamster buttons that she really, really loves, and a rock that she says Vendetta gave her, but actually, Vendetta just threw it at her. You didn't hear that from me. Anyway, Vendetta brings like this like shoebox for show and tell, and it ends up having a fiend in it, which is no shocker here. This fiend immediately takes Charlotte and runs off to the, you know, schoolyard, but nothing happens to her because another one of Vendetta's fiends, who's this giant red cat we see at the beginning of the episode, actually kind of 
helps Charlotte. After this encounter, Charlotte is so excited to see this cat, and she introduces it to her hamster, Buttons, who, unlike Vendetta's, like, giant assistant hamster, um, he's normal-sized. Buttons gets so scared at the, like, the ginormous cat in front of him. After Charlotte says, shake hands with the kitty. Come on, Buttons, shake hands with the kitty. Shake. Shake? Though that he runs away, causing the giant kitty to chase him around the schoolyard, destroying, you know, the fiends that were on the playground in the first place, which her classmates just watch in, like, horror. Like, they don't know what's gonna happen. Especially because the whole time this is happening, Vendetta and her hamster were out getting ice cream to celebrate the end of Charlotte, I guess. So you can just imagine kind of how infuriated she would be upon her, you know, arrival back to school to find out, like, what just happened. But when Vendetta warns Charlotte to stay away from her fiends, her only response is, what's your favorite kind of monkey? We better get back to class. Stay away from my fiends! Okay, what's your favorite kind of monkey? What? We better get back to class. What? <laughs> but yeah, that was episode one. It just kind of establishes the relationship between these two main characters. On to episode two, though. Why don't we pretend to be telemarketers? Yippee! It's titled A Fiendish Friend, and it opens with Charlotte playing on the seemingly fiend friend school playground and then asking Vendetta to join her, which she seems insulted by. With this, Charlotte sings a small musical number of all the things that they could pretend to be, just for it to end with Vendetta yelling at her and then saying she should just pretend to be dead, which she takes very literally and like flops on the ground. It reminded me of like when I was a kid and I'd pretend to be dead in the pool to see if anyone would care. No, why don't you pretend to be dead? Okay. Also, this is our first song. The show is actually very musical. I didn't remember that part of it whatsoever, and it was really fun. Anyway, after this, we cut to Vendetta and her hamster eating at a restaurant called Lee Mayonnaise. Is mayonnaise an instrument? No, Patrick. When Charlotte all of a sudden interrupts them, still playing along with the whole pretending to be dead thing, only this time she pretends to be a ghost, which causes Vendetta to abruptly leave the restaurant. However, this does not stop there, because she ends up finding Charlotte at her house later, this time in her attic, and she's rattling chains. The only thing Charlotte does, though, when she's told to stop is she suggests a bunch of other things they could pretend to be instead, and this obviously causes Vendetta to kick her out of her house, and it's clear that Charlotte is in for another rude awakening. So we cut to the next day, and Charlotte actually receives a present from Vendetta, which reads, Dear stupid girl, that's me! Here's a new friend for you to play with. A very good friend indeed. Heh heh heh. Yours fatally. Vendetta! So she opens it and out jumps this like crow looking bird which slices through her mailbox with his beak, then the tire swing, then the tree that the tire swing was hanging on, then the house, and then, well... Ooh, a puppy! I've always wanted a puppy! <laughs> was that the bite of 87?! Vendetta gets to school and then sees that Charlotte is not there. She immediately assumes, wow, my plan went to plan, and so is the viewer. However, despite the odds, somehow, Charlotte survived, which leaves Vendetta very perplexed because this fiend that she created and sent to Charlotte all of a sudden loves Charlotte? I mean, who wouldn't love Charlotte after all? This episode ends up ending with her thanking Vendetta for the new puppy because now she can pretend to be so many things and gives examples right then and there using her new uh, fiend turned friend. I love you! Our next episode is titled Super Evil, aka the episode I mentioned earlier from my childhood that I have nostalgia for. It opens up with Vendetta and her hamster sitting at a onion-shaped onion food stand while her hamster seems to be enjoying today's special. Vendetta, though, is reading her evil magazine, which she notices this issue has a, like, magazine quiz, which she excitedly fills out, and the excitement continues when she finishes the quiz and scores mostly evil, but she isn't too happy for long when Charlotte decides to show up and also do the quiz, but she scores super evil. This devastates Vendetta because if you can't trust a magazine quiz, then who can you trust? With this, Vendetta starts to kind of study Charlotte because how could she have not noticed how evil she is before? In fact, she goes as far to search Charlotte's house to find out where she could be hiding her evil, suspecting that her bow could actually be the power behind it all. I really respect your theory, Vendetta. That's honestly a very good one, and that would be cool if it were true. And then when, you know, Charlotte finds her because she's literally in her house. Charlotte, what are you doing here? This is my room! She makes up some lame excuse about being here to find a kazoo. Oh, oh yes! I was just, um, uh, uh, looking for this! 
There it is! But shortly after this, she kind of reveals her true intentions and she asks, you know, Charlotte to reveal her evil secrets to her, which Charlotte excitedly agrees. But her quote unquote evil secrets include baking cookies she wants to give to people as presents because everyone loves cookies. However, the fact that she scored higher than Vendetta on this quiz makes Vendetta decide to like actually take the cookies and give them to people because if Charlotte's so evil, maybe she should just listen to her. But when she tries to give a cookie to Malachi and even smiles at him, this results in him only begging on his knees for, you know, her to let him not eat a cookie because he's too young to perish. Although Malachi is a very unimportant background character, I want to highlight him because he is honestly one of my favorites. Basically the whole gag with his character is he speaks entirely in like Elizabethan English and it's absolutely hilarious. What dost thou want with me? Anyway, um, Charlotte's evil ways work for Vendetta, and she decides that Charlotte should make a fiend since she was so good at being evil, and she kind of leaves her to her own devices, wanting it to be a surprise. But when we cut to later when the fiend is done and she releases it in the schoolyard, it tells everyone, I love you, and it gives them a hug. <laughs> This catches Vendetta completely off guard because that's not evil at all. So this episode ends with Vendetta demanding to know how she scored so high on the quiz if she's not even evil at all. It's here that Charlotte reveals that she didn't even look at the questions, she actually just drew a pretty picture. Personally, if I was Vendetta, I would have came to that conclusion so much sooner because it took her like a very long time to fill out the quiz. Like her hamster had a whole stack of onions and he ate them all and when he finally ate them all was when she finished the quiz, but it took Charlotte like five seconds. That's a little suspicious is all I'm saying. But yeah, as I said earlier, this was an ending I fully suspected because the memories kind of came back to me and I was like, whoa, I did watch this. I spoiled myself by remembering the ending. <laughs> but let's move on to episode four titled Vegetables. Eat vegetables. Which takes place at a different setting for once, in the school's cafeteria. This episode opens with the most bizarre assortment of items you've ever seen for a school lunch, and somehow Charlotte asks the lunch lady if, you know, they're ever gonna bother to serve anything else in the nicest way possible. The lunch lady keeps her composure though, and she suggests to check the lunch menu, which literally just says beef jerky, clams, great punch, over and over again. And it's obvious shortly into this conversation that Vendetta is the reason behind this, and the lunch lady reveals that here we follow the triangle of tastiness, which is mollusks, dried meats, and punches. How are you gonna follow the triangle of tastiness and then pick the worst punch? I always see people saying that like, orange is so gross when it comes to like artificial flavors, but grape? It tastes like straight up medicine. Grape is like the worst. I love grapes, just not artificial grapes. So grape punch to me is just, it makes my stomach hurt. Please, I don't wanna be reminded of this. Shockingly though, Charlotte is the first ever kid to actually think vegetables are important and even sings a little about her love for them. But Vendetta shuts this down very quickly, not knowing what is to come. We cut to the next day and Charlotte announces that she helped the lunch lady, Mrs. Millet, make lunch and is going to help serve it. But the lunch is no longer the triangle of tastiness, it's a bunch of vegetables, which upsets Vendetta immediately. But Mrs. Millet, who is probably scared for her life, ends up having like some usual, you know, jerky clams punch for Vendetta set aside, which solves this conflict, at least for now. But Charlotte doesn't let this discourage her. She ends up going to her grandma and asking if she has any cookbooks and explaining like the problem at hand, how Vendetta only likes jerky clams and great punch, but she thinks that she would actually like vegetables, which her grandma agrees. And then it's revealed that her grandma actually has like this whole library full of cookbooks. Like, in my opinion, this is more powerful than anything Vendetta has ever made. But she hands Charlotte a specific one that should do just the trick. It's called How to Conceal Carrots. So because of this cookbook, she's actually able to make a recipe to conceal carrots and the next day successfully serves them to Vendetta. And what she makes is specifically a clam, beef jerky, and great punch casserole, which literally sounds but just like Charlotte thought, Vendetta actually really likes it, like to the point that she starts scarfing it down a little too quickly, in fact, and almost chokes. Almost chokes on specifically a carrot. 
But Vendetta doesn't realize that it was a carrot. She actually thinks that Charlotte just straight up tried to poison her and even starts like clutching her throat and falls to the ground. But you know, Charlotte's like, what? I didn't do that. Like, it's just a carrot, silly. Which Vendetta then responds to by saying, um, that's worse than poisoning me. Anyway, this leads to her bringing Charlotte an entire plate of vegetables as some sort of form of revenge the very next day. And the twist is that they are alive and immediately start bouncing around the lunchroom, causing like immediate chaos. <laughs> which Vendetta considers her job well done and leaves, uh, but shortly returns because she realizes, hey, um, I don't hear screaming anymore. And it turns out in this very short period of time that she left, Charlotte actually calmed down the vegetables and taught them a song because in Charlotte's words, they were too cute to eat. So the vegetables then sing a song to Vendetta about how important it is to eat them. And that's how the episode ends. I can't lie, this song is so catchy, but the fact that she taught vegetables a song about how you should eat them is taking me out. Vendetta, I am 100% on your side with this. You were justified with that reaction. That would be me too. Your feet will smell my trout. Now, in this next episode, unlike the past couple episodes we've discussed, this doesn't actually follow the typical antics of Vendetta and Charlotte, but we of course still do see Vendetta's antics at play. It's just from the perspective of a bystander, aka Mr. Milk. Titled To Pay, this episode opens with and follows their teacher, Mr. Milk. The first thing we see is he's hiding, or he's trying to hide from this teacher named Mrs. Minty before popping back out to say hi and attempt to ask her something, but he gets too nervous and just says, goodbye and walks away kind of all defeated and sad. After he gets to his classroom though, Charlotte gives him an apple, which he actually appreciates so much. And he said he's never gotten an apple before. We even see him smile. But unfortunately, this joy results in Vendetta just wanting to one up Charlotte and promises to bring him a better gift, which she does the very next day. And you know what she brings him? A toupee! Only this isn't your average ordinary toupee, it can talk. So naturally this toupee has more self-confidence than Mr. Milk does. So when Mr. Milk is out and about and the, wearing the toupee, the toupee starts to like talk to people and they think it's Mr. Milk. And one of the people that starts to walk up to the street eventually is Mrs. Minty, which makes Mr. Milk very nervous. And he tells the toupee, you know, stop that, like stop talking for me. But the toupee ends up complimenting Mrs. Minty and she really appreciates this. This gets Mr. Milk an invite to her weekly book club. And Mr. Milk is so excited, like, over the moon about this because he tells the toupee he's actually been trying to talk to Mrs. Minty for months. Later when Mr. Milk is home and him and the toupee are kind of reflecting on how great of a day today was, he clearly starts to try to bargain with Mr. Milk, saying he could do more for him than what he just did today. Mr. Milk ends up saying, you know, he's always wanted to work at the bank and the toupee suggests that he could help Mr. Milk become the best kind of banker a Swiss banker. So we get this musical number about Mr. Milk, like, and how he could be a Swiss banker. It's funny because after this musical number, I noticed, like, he has a poster that says Swiss with a block of cheese. One of the shorts we'll talk about later is about cheese, so it's also funny for that reason too. After the musical number concludes, he agrees, and he asks, you know, what he needs to do to have the toupee help him, all excitedly, but the answer has him absolutely horrified destroy Charlotte. The ending of this episode honestly makes me really sad for Mr. Milk. Obviously, like, he refuses to hurt Charlotte, but he seems so unhappy with the state of his life that he definitely contemplates. But he knows deep down he couldn't possibly hurt Charlotte, so we follow him kind of losing his sanity about it, honestly. And the toupee, you know, really wanting to do it and says it would be so easy, and it just causes him a lot of distress. And by the end of the episode, instead of pushing Charlotte off the ledge like the toupee wants him to do, he throws the toupee off the ledge, and then he picks up Charlotte and he, like, takes her away from the ledge just to make sure that she's safe. And then suddenly Mrs. Minty appears at this, like, random ledge and invites Mrs. Mr. Milk to join her and a friend for onions, but before Mr. Milk can, like, get an answer out, she just walks away and says, maybe next time. So seemingly Mr. Milk is back to where he started at the beginning of the episode, back to square one, and made me really sad for him because he deserves to be happy. Moving on though to episode six, titled Mama Vendetta, it starts with Vendetta showing a group of adults in town a statue she made of herself to remind them that she should be feared. However, this gets the attention of Charlotte too, who loves the new statue, 
so much that she, you know, gets it a giant hat, a purse, and even draws a smile on it. Well, it's supposed to be lip gloss, but with this, Vendetta knows what she needs to do. Make some fiends to, of course, protect her statue, but also to destroy Charlotte, duh. But when she makes these absolutely adorable pigeon fiends, those are her words, not mine. Personally, they remind me of can your pet. If you know, you know. But instead of exploding Charlotte like they were requested, they just end up following Vendetta around because they think she's their mom. Very chick-like behavior once again. Charlotte sees this though and offers to be the father because they don't have one and we get a sequence of them doing like very family-like things as Vendetta loses whatever sanity she ever had in the first place. At the end, she's so depleted, like she loses all the joy she once had in her life and thinks it's honestly time her life expires. Why are you lying down? Is it nap time? No, I am wishing for my life to expire. This world has become too much. But in a disturbing twist, Charlotte helps her realize that these chicks, I mean pigeons, can explode so easily, in fact, that she can just throw them off the ledge of this rock and they'll be gone forever, right? Well, no. Plot twist, they actually learn to fly and they even form a V for Vendetta. Oh, how cute. This episode then ends with Vendetta being so upset that she runs into her own statue, which in a future episode we see that she like tried to piece it or tape it back together. She destroys it if it wasn't obvious. I just like said that she fixed it and I didn't even say she destroyed it, but not completely because you know what is left though? Her pretty elbow. Not completely. We can still swing from your pretty, pretty elbow. Whee! We can eat gumdrops every day. Episode seven is titled Shrinking Charlotte and it opens up with Charlotte getting hit by a train. But not to fear, it's just the pokey bubble train, nothing too crazy. Like usual, Vendetta takes offense to this because how dare she not only hit her with a train, but how dare she open a store that Vendetta caused to close in the first place. We then cut back to the girls at school and Charlotte, I forgot to mention she had buttons in the train. I probably showed it, but she now has buttons in a tiny toy car, like a Barbie car. But it turns out that Vendetta took the, I wish I could ride the train too, very literally. <laughs> If only I could ride the train too! And brought this slug to school that shrinks whatever it touches. One of my favorite jokes in this show has gotta be how Charlotte refers to like every animal as a puppy, and this slug is no exception. Ooh, a puppy. What? The goal with it though was for, you know, the slug to shrink Charlotte and then for the slug to eat her. But with how fast slugs can go, Vendetta gets very impatient and ends up touching the slug herself, which shrinks her too. Damn, like, if only you watched Turbo Vendetta. That was a snail, not a slug. My bad. The slug then tries to eat Vendetta because she, like, just got there and now she's small too. But her hamster, like, henchman ends up slapping the slug away, which causes him to then shrink to normal hamster size too. Also, yes, her hamster's name is Grudge. I didn't really mention that. I've been calling him Hamster because that's what Vendetta always calls him. So there's Buttons, which is Charlotte's hamster, and then there's Grudge, which is Vendetta's. Anyway, after this, Charlotte is so excited. We get this like musical number about how many things they can do now that they're small, but Vendetta just is not having it and races home to find a solution. No, like I mean, she literally races home. She steals Button's car. Get in, stupid hamster. Drive us home. I must find a way to be big again. Mm. Mm. This causes her though to become a giant, but then she shakes the building like to get Charlotte because she's so desperate that the slug falls out onto her face, making her regular sized again. But then the slug falls into the jar of squid that she used to size herself up, causing the slug to become ginormous and Charlotte to grow too. And then after this, there's just a huge sequence of like everyone and everything like fluctuating in sizes. But once again, there's another instant of this cat who's supposed to be a fiend too, like defending Charlotte against this slug that Vendetta is still trying to get to eat Charlotte. But the ending of this episode is honestly great. Basically it ends with Vendetta being the only one that's still small. So her plan backfiring on her once again. And then she has Vendetta and Buttons in this like miniature plane and Charlotte throws them. Next we have episode eight titled Parents, which like just like the title suggests, this episode opens with the school holding a parent teacher night. The only family we like don't see who isn't there yet is Vendetta's. An immediate thought you have 
watching the show is where are her parents? So this episode gives us crucial information. Basically, she walks in right after this and it's revealed that Vendetta's parents are actually shrunk and kept in a hamster cage. Here is my stupid classroom, full of stupid children. It's also touched on that Charlotte's parents are absent and nowhere to be seen throughout the entirety of the show. She's only ever been with her grandma. She says this is because they're up there in a better place, but it actually turns out the better place is space and they're astronauts. So this implies either her parents are dead or her grandma is lying to her that they went to space or that they died in space. Instructions unclear. As you can imagine though, Vendetta takes this information very seriously and comes up with her next plan, her most fucked up plan, kind of in her words too. Do you not think this is my cruelest plan yet? See, the next day she shows up at Charlotte's house saying that basically her parents wanted to come and visit. Only for it not really even to be her parents, it's fiends that Vendetta made to trick Charlotte. But Charlotte falls for it and she's overjoyed. Like we get this whole song following this about how much she's just missed her parents and how happy she is that they came home from space. Like usual, the fiends actually come around to like Charlotte, end up treating her as if she really was their child. It's honestly really sad, but like really cute at the same time. But during this time, Vendetta is truly the happiest she's ever been in a long time. Because she believes that like finally she successfully destroyed Charlotte because she hadn't seen Charlotte in like a week. But she hadn't seen her in a week because she'd been spending all that time with her new fiend parents, which Vendetta discovers after, you know, being at the park and then she sees Charlotte and her parents walking through the same park. However, the ending of this episode is genuinely like so sad. Basically, Charlotte takes her parents to uh, Whale Watch, which she says is like one of the joys of uh, Clamberg. And Vendetta is there with a like rocket launcher thing and she's realized like, hey, this has gone on for too long. Uh, but before she can even like interview or do anything, they get eaten by the whale. So with this, she realizes, oh, I can just blast Charlotte now. Perfect, she'll be destroyed. But when Vendetta is rushing Grudge to do this, he messes up, ends up launching it into the sky. So the episode ends with Charlotte realizing that her parents are gone and she looks up at the sky and she says, They went back into space. Bye, Mommy. Bye, Daddy. I'm glad you came for a visit. This is so fucked up. <laughs> Episode 9 is titled No Singing and it opens up with Vendetta getting upset at another character named Marvin because he was humming and she, you know, states, hey, no singing is allowed. But then she hears an even more terrible sound as she's lecturing this poor kid and that is Charlotte singing. So the plot of this episode follows Vendetta who's really fed up with Charlotte singing and plotting to destroy her once again, this time by making a fiend that is designed to be angered by the sound of music. But the next day at school, it's show and tell and a student shares a poem about a kitten getting like stuck up somewhere high and not being able to get down. And for once we see Charlotte get visibly upset, which messes with Vendetta's plan because Charlotte says she only sings when she's happy. So Vendetta knows what she needs to do make Charlotte happy. So this episode is spent trying to make Charlotte happy again so that she can sing and then, you know, Vendetta can destroy her. But where Vendetta goes wrong is she does all the things that make her happy rather than what makes Charlotte happy. And then when Charlotte brings up the kitten again towards the end of the episode, Vendetta offers solutions to make the kitten fall rather than save it like Charlotte was asking. And the remainder of this episode really shows how far like Vendetta will go in my opinion. Like she puts on a paper hat, something she finds absolutely repulsive and she starts to get so desperate that she herself starts singing. This sets off the fiend she had made to like be angered by music and it tries to destroy her instead of Charlotte. So yet another plan has backfired on her. Funny enough though, this episode ends with Charlotte putting on the same hat and finally solving her problem, saying she could save the kitten with monkeys wearing parachutes, all thanks to Vendetta. Episode 10 is titled Puppies, Puppies, Puppies and once again it opens at that same onion shop, but we don't really stay there for long as we get a little compilation of Charlotte annoying Vendetta, like from showing her her new sparkly yo-yo, cutting up her magazines to make Vendetta's head out of them, and even showing up in her house as she's asleep, waking her up by playing the tuba. Vendetta is so thoroughly annoyed by this that she decides to put her new fiend invention to use and, you know, put an end to Charlotte once and for all.
for All, which basically is this machine that duplicates the fiends. Shortly after this, um, Charlotte like spawns in her house out of nowhere, and Vendetta takes this as her opportunity to leave, knowing that Charlotte will be gone for good. But what Vendetta learns soon is this was a bad mistake. Vendetta's worst fear that she didn't even realize she had happens. Charlotte duplicates herself with the machine so that she can take care of all these like little fiends that were made to attack her, but in her eyes, they're puppies and she wants to take care of them, but there's only one of her. So she duplicates herself to solve the problem. So we get the scene of Charlotte like slowly popping up everywhere and then Vendetta trying to like outrun all the Charlottes. But of course she stands no chance. There's one of her and so many of them. Hi Vendetta, hi Vendetta, hi Vendetta. No, it cannot be. Charlotte's coming out of everywhere. Hi Vendetta, hi Vendetta. My favorite part of this sequence has to be when they all do Charlotte's little teehee in sync together. <laughs> But they're trying to take Vendetta, basically, and they do catch her. The reason in the first place they're doing this is because they have a surprise for her. This turns out to be a circus completely composed of Charlotte's and her fiends, now known as Charlotte's puppies. The final event of this surprise was going to be Vendetta being shot out of a cannon, which actually causes her to faint. Luckily, Grudge, like, sweeps in and saves her. And then the episode ends with Vendetta making a giant fiend to eat all the Charlotte's. And the funniest part is she lures the Charlotte's to the giant fiend with a sign that says, free gumdrops for stupid girls. Ooh, free gumdrops for stupid girls. That's us. Yippee. Vendetta's always calling her stupid girl and Charlotte will even respond to it. And I just find it so funny. But this is definitely the funniest instance of her calling her stupid girl. All the Charlottes are like, oh, that's me. Or they say that's us because there's so many of them. Anyway, this plan is actually very successful compared to other plans that Vendetta's had throughout the show, and she thinks that, like, finally, Charlotte is now gone for good. Why didn't I do this forever ago? But like always, it turns out that Charlotte did survive. However, at this point, you know, she's really just grateful that there's just one Charlotte and not several Charlottes. Or so she thinks. Episode 11 is titled Marvin the Middle Manager. Marvin's a character we like saw briefly at the beginning of an episode earlier, but this episode follows Vendetta as she makes the decision to no longer attend school after Charlotte sings a song about loving school so much and then implies that Vendetta must love it so much because she's here every day. But Vendetta knows that if she does do this, she can't just leave the school alone and would need to hire someone to watch over things. She specifically wants someone that is easy to control and that person just ends up being Marvin. Because obviously if that were Charlotte, she knows that wouldn't work. So starting the next day, Marvin is put in charge and his first like business of duty on his list is using a fiend by the slide to make students scream, which he immediately struggles with and Vendetta picks up on this when she calls him and she's concerned because she doesn't hear any screaming. Shortly after this though, uh, Charlotte is like, oh wow, a phone. And then she takes it and then she destroys the phone. Well, technically she does it, but she gives it to a fiend who ends up destroying it. Intentional if you ask me. After this, uh, Marvin decides that he really needs to finish, just get this list done, and the next thing on the to-do list is to feed books to the library fiends that, you know, he clearly still is struggling with. So Charlotte sees this and offers to help, because Charlotte believes if they work together to, you know, accomplish everything on the list, that it can be finished in time. Well, that is until they reach the very last thing on the list, which is to destroy Charlotte. She hears this and has, like, all sorts of fun ideas, ironically. That sounds easy enough. Maybe I could be attacked by wolverines. Uh. Or how about if I was catapulted to the moon? But the one she goes with is dressing like a butterfly while she gets hit by a piano. However, because the phone got destroyed, Vendetta hasn't gotten a call in several hours, which is worrying her. So she ends up going back to the school. And the moment she shows up, it's right as Charlotte is about to get hit by the piano and she jumps out of the way to say hi to Vendetta just in time. <gasps> Vendetta? 
This episode then ends on an infuriating note, if you ask me, with Marvin getting in trouble for singing and dancing, when Charlotte is the one who got him into this mess in the first place, but she also got him to start singing with her. However, Charlotte doesn't defend him, she doesn't even flinch at the sight of him getting taken away, she just agrees with Vendetta that no one does her job better than her, and she actually seems overjoyed. It's quite confusing. We're gonna circle back to this episode at the end, but we're gonna move on to episode 12 titled Parent Napped, which is exactly what the title suggests. Do you guys remember like how Vendetta's parents were shrunk and kept in a hamster cage? Well at the beginning of this episode we start with Vendetta like speeding off to the park where she finds Charlotte had taken them and they're having a picnic. At first she threatens to take them back home but they complain about how you know they're having a good time and Vendetta never takes them out anymore. I got the impression from this that she doesn't treat them very well. She doesn't feed them very well specifically. She just gives them a daily bean. Vendetta ultimately lets this go and she leaves the park letting them stay with Charlotte, but when hours, like several hours pass, and they're still with Charlotte, she sends one of her fiends to retrieve them. However, they end up kidnapping Charlotte's grandma instead, so Vendetta sends like a very threatening note, which Charlotte takes as Vendetta just wanting to trade parents, which for some reason she couldn't be more excited about. She's so excited that she spends the whole day with Vendetta's parents the next day and doesn't go to school, and she even builds them a whole amusement park. Meanwhile, Charlotte's grandma shows up at the school to bring Vendetta of her lunch she forgot and a new sweater she knitted. But the other thing she does that's really funny is she sprays this can of new car smell, which of course is the best smell in the land. It's new car smell. There's nothing better than that new car smell. But the final straw is when she arrives home to her entire house being waxed. So she immediately storms off to Charlotte's house to retrieve her parents and is successful returning Charlotte her grandma. This experience with Charlotte really made a uh, Vendetta's parents hate Charlotte just as much as Vendetta does. But worst of all, this made them really appreciate their daily bean. Now, another standout episode for me has got to be this next one, episode 12, titled Smash. And this episode opens up with Charlotte and the marching band practicing for the parade where they will be performing a song that Charlotte wrote about pancakes to celebrate the pancake festival. Shockingly, Vendetta is not upset about this and says like that's a wonderful idea because it sparks an idea for her to make a fiend that will flatten Charlotte like a pancake since she loves them so much. But when she brings the fiend to marching band practice, Charlotte moves around so much that she isn't able to have the fiend squish her. So Vendetta tries to push her toward the fiend and make her stand still but let's just say that didn't really work very well in her favor. The girls were so close together that the fiends smushed them. It smushed them together, so they've become fused as one. Not only is this terrible because Vendetta hates Charlotte, but it's terrible because she made this fiend in particular, like designed to only attack Charlotte. Like in the recipe, she puts a photo of Charlotte. So now that she and Charlotte are one, it means the fiend is also going after her. Luckily during this first encounter, Charlotte leads them to the swing set and the fiend gets like flung far away from them. But this doesn't last long because it shows up again at the pancake festival. And this time of uh, trying to save them, Grudge actually gets like in the way and the girls get fused onto Grudge. And by the way, Grudge has fleas, so this is not a pleasant experience for them. Or at least for Vendetta, because she's very self-aware. Charlotte just thinks they could get a cute flea collar while they're at it. Fleas! Ooh! Let's buy an extra large flea collar! With pretty flowers and bells on it? But this ultimately does save them though, because Grudge smells so bad that the fiend gets grossed out and leaves them alone. After this point though, it starts to rain, and unfortunately, Charlotte says they'll have to probably cancel the kite flying contest, but this sparks an idea in Vendetta. The perfect idea to potentially split them up, because they're still attached and fused together, which is getting electrocuted by lightning. This actually works, and that's how the episode ends. <laughs> wee, 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 wee. Episode 13 titled New Best Friend is honestly one of the most telling episodes to me. Similar to Toupee, this episode follows a background character named Marion as she plans to escape the town and escape Vendetta specifically, aiming to cross the border into Canada, which she has planned extensively for months. But just then when she's about to put the plan in action, Vendetta actually shows up unannounced to her house and just declares that she'll be moving in temporarily with Marion because she basically she made termite fiends that she was going to make to destroy Charlotte's house, but instead they destroyed her house. So now her house is going to be tented for three days. As she's packing, uh, Marion was actually able to conceal her plan pretty well, but then Charlotte like shows up out of nowhere and starts to ruin everything. I followed you. Ooh, look at the pretty pickaxe. I 
bet you could use it to dig a hole all the way to Canada! Luckily for Marion, Vendetta doesn't really like put two and two together. The rest of this episode basically just follows Vendetta using Marion though to make Charlotte feel sad because she realizes if she's always playing with Vendetta, then Charlotte will finally leave her alone because she'll be with Marion rather than with Charlotte, which makes Charlotte really, really sad. So for once, we get a song from Vendetta in this episode, and the song is all about, you know, pretending to have fun, but plot twist? Marion actually starts to have fun and take a liking to Vendetta. So it's especially annoying when, again, Charlotte tries to bring up Marion's plan to leave to Vendetta. With this, Marion decides that Charlotte really needs to go for good, and they work together on a plan to destroy her. The plan, of course, requiring the girls to make yet another fiend, but all of a sudden, right then and there as they're making this fiend, Vendetta gets a call that her house is ready and drops everything she's doing to immediately pack all her stuff and go right back to her house. With her parting words to Marion, being telling Marion that they aren't friends and that she's actually stupider than Charlotte? Probably wondering, Lula, what happens to the fiend they just made? Well, this episode ends with Marion ultimately deciding she still has the time, she can still escape now, I guess, but instead the fiend they had just made ends up destroying her house and she's told it'll take three weeks to repair, so she's left with no choice but to move in with Charlotte. And that's how the episode ends. This is another episode we'll circle back to at the end, but boy does it infuriate me. Oh my god, I felt so bad for Marion. But moving on to episode 14, titled Tornado, it starts off with, you know, typical Charlotte and Vendetta banter. Charlotte wants to have a slumber party, but Vendetta hates Charlotte. She says specifically that her house is only for her. So when Charlotte suggests going to her house instead of Vendetta's, Vendetta agrees, but she's clearly up to no good. So then we cut to Vendetta arriving at Charlotte's house and immediately immediately giving her a gift, which ends up being a tornado, and it sweeps Charlotte and Grudge away. However, Charlotte and her house get dropped back off at Vendetta's house, which as you can imagine is her worst nightmare, and Grudge gets like lands in the middle of the desert somewhere. So the rest of this episode follows Charlotte as she, you know, terrorizes Vendetta because simply because she's there. From using her fiends for like gardening or just being on her property, it makes Vendetta extremely annoyed. We get another song in this episode from Charlotte about how excited she is to be neighbors while Vendetta keeps building more and more walls and more and more moats. And the whole time this is happening, Grudge is making the long voyage back to Clamberg. Compared to most episodes, I feel like this one shows Vendetta like losing her sanity over her hatred for Charlotte the most. I feel like Vendetta is someone who really like uh, appreciates personal space at times, so this was like a nightmare for her. She can't seem to really escape Charlotte and it's actually driving her crazy. However, this episode ends with Grudge, you know, arriving back home and pushing Charlotte's house off the hill and it slides perfectly back to where it used to be, just in time for Charlotte's grandma to come back from the store. Before she released the tornado, Charlotte's grandma has said, bye guys, I'm going to the store. Now be good. I'm going to the store. I'll be right back. So she arrives at the perfect time where the house is just back to where it used to be. And finally, we've reached our final episode, episode 15, titled Pony. This episode starts with Vendetta, like, enjoying some good old onions at the onion shack, while Charlotte makes a proposal to Vendetta that she should make her a pony because she's learning how to lasso and it would just make everything easier. After this, we get a little musical sequence uh, with Charlotte begging for a pony while, you know, showing Vendetta her drawing of what she'd want the pony to look like, which causes Vendetta to eventually agree, realizing she could use making a pony to her advantage, like making the pony to destroy Charlotte. But as we know, uh, Charlotte has her way with Vendetta's fiends, so they all seem to come around and like her, hence why she hasn't been destroyed. So she makes Charlotte a pony that she asked for, only it's ginormous. But Charlotte is still able to lasso it and ride the pony into town, making everyone around her very unhappy and scared. But Charlotte is happier than ever, singing us a song about how now that she has a pony, she can do more things than ever. As she's singing this though, the pony eats the onion stand and then they practice jumps and the pony destroys the town's water tower. And this makes the town's people very uneasy, but they increasingly get more and more scared as these things are happening. So scared, in fact, that they go to Vendetta for help. Vendetta has complete control of this town, so they wouldn't usually go to her because they are already so scared of her. But she does agree that she needs to put a stop to it, so she says she'll help. Wait, you are more frightened of Charlotte than you are of me? Nobody is to be more frightening than me, especially not Charlotte. You are stupid, but 
I will help you. So Vendetta creates another fiend. It's like this giant eagle bird thing, and it flies over the pony, and it picks it up and flies away forever, saving the town. Kind of an unfortunate episode to leave us on, because, like, for all we ever know, like, their water tower was never restored, the onion shack never got rebuilt. What happened here? I need to know the aftermath. But those were all the episodes, and now before we wrap things up and go into my final thoughts, I do want to give a short summary of the shorts that aired as a part of these episodes. There were two sets of shorts, and these served as like a commercial for a store in Clamberg. For example, the first one was the onion stand. Who wants onions? Is it so good to eat? Ooh, ooh, onions. That round and punchy treat. And then the second one was the pet supply store. And each of these shorts basically open with a segment about like what they're advertising before cutting to a story involving our main characters of Vendetta and Charlotte. Short one details the girls as they write um, about how their day they spent together was. Charlotte starts with Dear Pretty Diary in her room while Vendetta starts with Dear Stupid Journal in her room. And just like those are vastly different, the descriptions of their day that they spent together is also vastly different. While Charlotte had a great time and describes like all the fun they had, Vendetta details her terrible, terrible day all because Charlotte broke into her house. One thing that happened for sure though, and wasn't one-sided, was the two of them actually did play Battle Sheep, or aka Battleship, which was actually really sweet to hear. After this, we get a little musical number from Charlotte about how much she just loves living in Clamberg, before cutting to a little, like, commercially segment bit about how Clamberg is a must-see visit for tourists, while the whole time during this little commercially bit, Vendetta keeps interrupting to tell everyone to stay the hell away from Clamberg. <laughs> I warned you! Stay away from Clamberg! Moving on to short number two, it's titled The Land of Cheese, and it opens with Charlotte reading a book called The Book of Cheese, which seems to be about cheese and its history. While she's asleep, though, she dreams about this like cheese land. It's basically a land full of cheese, an absolute paradise if you ask me. This was the short I mentioned earlier when talking about toupee. So it's even funnier that he had that sign uh, with the Swiss cheese because they have a whole short dedicated to cheese. Shortly after arriving in this dream though, she wishes Vendetta was there with her, but because this is a dream, she of course magically appears. And the two then enjoy the cheese together, even singing a song about how much they love cheese, especially how great cheese is when enjoyed with a friend. Well, that is until Vendetta remembers, hey, I don't normally sing. And I don't normally like you. So because this is a dreamland, she's able to just think of and spawn a fiend, and it starts destroying the cheese land, melting all the cheese with its fiery breath. But Charlotte, not gonna lie, she's pretty smart. She uses this to her advantage, making grilled cheese sandwiches out of the melted cheese. And then similar to the last short that ended on a song, well, before the little commercially bit, this one ends with a song from Charlotte and Vendetta about how Charlotte wants to live on the moon, and then how happy Vendetta would be if she lived on the moon and how she supports her living on the moon because she'd be so so far away and get destroyed on the moon and there we have it that was the entirety of making fiends of course this doesn't include the webisodes but nevertheless it was such a treat to revisit now that we've covered the material i want to kind of give some of my final thoughts if you know me you know i am an enjoyer of gay people. I love myself a good gay ship, and you know, that's the note I'm gonna leave this video on. I failed to mention it in my Dear Dumb Diary video, and I regretted it so much, so no more holding back in 2023. Are you fucking stupid? <laughs> but I mentioned earlier having a theory and wanting to circle back to some episodes, and of course it's truly hard to know for sure with only six episodes, but I think that Charlotte and Vendetta have more in common than they realize. Going into the series, the first episode has you in this kind of mindset that, wow, Charlotte is here, some real change is going to be made in this town because of how everyone else is too afraid to stand up to Vendetta, including the adults. She has her own parents trapped in a hamster cage and feeds them only one bean per day. That should tell you all you need to know. However, nothing really changes. Things only ever seem to get worse in the town of Clamsburg, and I think we see this best with our very last episode, Pony. As the series progresses, Charlotte's once cluelessness seems to turn into more of intentionalness to me. The key standouts of this to me are the episodes Marvin the Middle Manager, Parent Napped, and New Best Friends. Something to note about these episodes and what they all have in common is they occur after the episode Puppies, 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 where Charlotte gets cloned. So for all we know, the shift in Charlotte Charlotte's behavior could come from the fact that she could be a totally different Charlotte than the Charlotte we met in episode one. In Marvin the Middle Manager, we see Charlotte as she assists Marvin in completing his list of tasks that Vendetta assigns him, only for Marvin in the end to get the blame, and Charlotte who doesn't even end up going through with her plan of, well, 
dying doesn't stand up for Marvin at all, despite everything that happened that day being at the fault of both of them. She doesn't even mention her helping Marvin at all. And we also can't forget towards the beginning of this episode, she destroys his phone, which is part of the reason she returned to school that day. There's also Parrot Napped, where she makes an amusement park for Vendetta's parents, forcing them to go on all the rides the entire day after already forcing them to overstay their welcome at her house. Like Charlotte is like, oh, Vendetta wants to switch parents. And they're like, uh, no. And then she takes them into her house anyway and keeps them longer than they intended to stay because they're so small and they can't really like do anything. They can't really leave. But essentially once she gets that note from Vendetta, the rest of the episode, she spends torturing Vendetta's parents. A wave machine! But the most damning evidence of all has to be what she did to Marion through the constant attempts to reveal her very specific plan. Like, how did she know that she was going to use that hole to go to Canada? That episode in particular really snapped me out of this mindset that she's completely oblivious. The fact that Marion actually started to like Vendetta just for her to ditch her like that, and then Marion in the end didn't even get to escape after planning for all those months so incredibly infuriating. But how does this have to do with gay people, Lula? Well, I mean, Vendetta's parents did say themselves. She talks about Charlotte all the time, despite them not being friends. There was literally that episode where they raise a family of chicks. I mean, I mean pigeons. Sorry, my bad. They had to know what they were doing. If not, who cares? But honestly, I just think it's really cute. I'm kind of a sucker for polar opposites who it turns out couldn't be more similar after all. It's a really cute character trope, honestly. And you know, I mean, there is a whole episode where Vendetta is clearly trying to cheer up Charlotte so much so that she, a person who despises singing, starts to sing to Charlotte. I know she hates her deep down, but I still find it really cute when Vendetta isn't trying to destroy her for once and everything is just somewhat normal, just kids being kids. I know I said that was the note I was gonna leave you guys on, but I lied. The last thing I want to bring up is despite not being allowed to release any more episodes of Making Fiends due to the show being technically owned by Nickelodeon, in April 2015, Amy would debut a new series titled Baking Beans, which you know, I think you should all really check out. If you liked Making Fiends, you're gonna love Baking Beans. I don't know, they're so similar. I can't really quite put my finger on it though. Oh, did I mention it was April 1st? Through a series of fun and improbable events, the beans got canned! But with that, that was pretty much the story of Making Fiends. I hope you guys enjoyed and let me know in the comments, you know, your thoughts on the show and what memories you have associated with it. I want to make a lot more videos like this, hopefully this year. I just have a lot of shows from my childhood that I want to revisit and this gives me the excuse to and the excuse to also talk about what I enjoyed from these shows. I feel like short form content has rotted in my brain, like to the point where sitting down to watch a show or a movie that I want to watch can be really hard for me now. So kind of a new year's resolution to um, reverse that because that's horrible. I have so much stuff on my letterbox like watch list that's literally been there for like three years. But I had a lot of fun with this one and that's pretty much all for today. I hope you guys enjoyed and I will see you guys in my next video. Once there was a little girl, a girl who could make fiends. She kept the whole town terrified, the girl who could make fiends.